I go now? Wait, wait uh, it's 10.30 exactly, and then try to get their attention first, otherwise they'll just ignore you. That's good pedagogical lessons right there. <laughs> I appreciate that. <laughs> I do. No. If only. You like it? I, I almost wore it. Hey, good morning, everybody. Happy Monday. Hope everyone slept off the jet lag from spring break. My name is Ben Levin. I'm the incoming president of the Strategy and Operations Club. Next Tuesday, we're holding our flagship event, the SOC Forum. It's a night of really interesting speakers, headlined by Scott Pollack, who is the VP of Business Development for WeWork. There's also going to be a panel featuring strategy executives from BBC, PepsiCo, Google, and La Cologne Coffee Roasters. Uh, tickets are on sale now. You should have gotten a notification in, in several newsletters with a Campus Group link. Tickets are $15 for non-members, $5 for members. Uh, it should be a really great event, some interesting speakers, and the food theme is uh, breakfast for dinner, so we're going to have some bagels and donuts and things. So uh, come check it out. It's next Tuesday night, April 4th. Thanks. So if you need a reminder, I'm going to give you one. Even if you don't want it, your case is due day after tomorrow before class at 10.30. And please try to follow the format. I, you know, the email I sent yesterday, you know, just make it one big PDF file. Don't send a Word file. Don't send a Word file with six Excel files. It just clutters up the space. So just send a PDF file. And you can have all the tables. Just don't go crazy on table after table. I mean, the key tables I want are your cash flows that you're using for your analysis, your earnings, whatever the base numbers are. And you don't need to tell elaborate stories. There is no story to tell. It is basically, are you going to invest in this, you know, in this investment or not? And make sure in the subject you put in that, it might seem like I'm being picky. It's just to make sure that all the cases when they get submitted go into one smart mailbox. I know where to find them. Otherwise, I have 300 DCFs I got over the course of the weekend. And this gets, you know, individual DCFs. So if this gets hidden in that stuff for me to find. So just done in one PDF file for each group. And please, on the front page, I know this, sound, this sounds almost too s simple to be even stated. Put the names of everybody in the group in alphabetical order, not in order of how much work you thought you put in. I know you want to show me that you did the bulk of the work. You move your Z name to the top. It just makes my grade entry a nightmare because I'm going back, because I have to enter your grades into that big spreadsheet. So if you're in alphabetical order, it makes my life a little easier. 
So don't try to make my life a little easier when it comes to grading. I know I'm way down on your priority list in terms of, you know, but it is, for me, it'll save a lot of time if you can do that. And also, if you do get a chance, by whenever you can, you know, I said by tomorrow night, even by day after tomorrow morning, if you can just send in those five numbers, the final summary numbers, obviously you won't get to them till you're almost done. You know what I'm talking about? Basically, it is, you know, what your return on capital is, NPV, IRR, are you going to accept or reject? That's pretty much it. And the cost of capital or equity, the discount rate you use for this project. So essentially, give me those five numbers, because what I'll do is I'll collect them across the 90 groups plus... And on Wednesday, when I present the numbers, you can see what the, the class, so it's, you won't even just see my answer, you'll also see the distribution of your answers, okay? So any questions about the case, specifically the logistics before I get started? And please, no 110 page cases, okay? So kind of keep it, keep it focused. So today I want to start with a topic that we make a lot more complicated than it has to be. As many of you probably already know, I'm going to be on sabbatical next year, so I will not be teaching the valuation class. And one of the things I cover in the valuation class is acquisition valuation. So to make up for the fact that I will not have the class and you will not get that session, I'm going to take everything I know about acquisition valuation and fit it into five pages. And to be honest, it's not that complicated if you think about acquisitions as an extension of capital budgeting. Remember, remember I said acquisitions are just gigantic capital budgeting projects. They're cash in, cash out. If you keep them simple, your life in analyzing acquisitions also will stay simple. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to estimate the cash flows in the acquisition, thinking of it as a gigantic project. So your initial investment here is going to be what? It's whatever you pay to acquire the company. That's going to become your initial investment. Your cash flows will be the cash flows you get from the target company. There is a layer in acquisitions that I'm not going to deal with in these five pages, but I'll come back to, which is after you've estimated the cash flows for a target company, what else do you hope to get in an acquisition that I will not be able to capture in the cash flows of the target company? It's a word that you see used all the time in acquisitions, justified. Synergy. You know why I can't deal with synergy yet? Because to analyze synergy, I've got to bring in both companies into the picture. We'll hold off on that. We'll come back to it in the next session. For this session, I just want to value the target company first before I get overexcited about the synergy. So let's get the, the show on the road. And the, the acquisition I'm going to set up is a hypothetical. It's an acquisition of Tata Motors, the company we've been talking about, an Indian automobile company with Jaguar Land Rover as its juggernaut. And the company it's going to acquire is Harman Audio, which is a high-end audio company. So why would an automobile company buy a high-end audio company? The answer is very simple. If you look at especially the high-end of the automobile market, the quality of your audio, the stereo you get in the car, is a big component of the car. You're saying Bose speakers. You see this sometimes in high-end cars. So they want to buy Harman Audio to integrate it into their automobiles. So that's basically the acquisition I'm going to be looking at, is Tata Motors buying so this acquisition is going to hit every spot in acquisition valuation. It's a cross-border acquisition, right? An Indian company buying a U.S. company. So the first question I'm going to ask you is, Tata Motors, when it reports numbers, reports them in rupees. Harman Audio is a U.S. company, reports everything in dollars. Should I value Harman Audio in rupees or in dollars? Why dollars? So basically you're saying whenever I acquire a company, the currency of the target company, so if I, buy a, if I acquire a Russian company, should I do everything in rubles? I think that's a logical next step, right? If the acquiring companies, what do we say about currency? It shouldn't matter. So pick the currency that's more convenient. In this case, it turns out that dollars are more convenient, not because it's a US company, but because all the financials are in dollars. Might as well stay in that currency. But let's go the next step. If I decide to do the valuation in dollars, my cash flows for Harman Audio will be in dollars. My cost of capital also is to be in dollars. So let's start with that estimating the cost of capital for a target company. And as I go through the steps, at each step I'm going to ask you a what if question. So the first thing is because I'm doing everything in US dollars, my risk-free rate is the T-bond rate. 
It's not the Indian rupee rate. It's not so your currency choice drives your risk free rate. So my risk free rate is in US dollars. So it's basically the T bond rate. For the beta that I'm going to use to come up with my cost of equity, I have two choices. I can use the beta for Tata Motors, which is the acquiring company, or I can look at the beta of Harman Audio, which is the acquired company. Which one should I use? I'm using, I've already told you which one I'm using, so maybe the question I should be asking is, why am I using the beta for Harman Audio in valuing Harman Audio when in fact the acquiring company is Tata Motors and they have a different beta? We've already kind of dealt with it, right? Yeah. It's like a big electronics project. Exactly. When, when Disney invests in a theme park, what do we use as its cost of capital? Not the cost of capital Disney as a company, but the cost of cap. It's an extension of the same proposition. When you value a target company, you should always use the target company's risk characteristics to build up to a cost of capital. You know how often that rule is violated in acquisition valuation? Half of all acquisition valuations are screwed up right off the top. Why? Because they use the acquiring company's discount rate to value the target company using some contorted logic of, hey, they're coming up with the capital, why shouldn't I estimate a cost of capital to them? It's got nothing to do with where you raise capital, it's where you invest the money. So the beta I'm going to use is the beta for Harman Audio. Any questions? Because this, as I said, if you're going into M&A or in any kind of corporate finance, this is a fundamental principle that you've got to be willing to defend. Because as I said, lots of people use the acquiring company's numbers. You should never, ever, 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 never, ne ever, ever. If you kind of get it, there's no exception to this rule. This is one of those rules you don't mess with. You think, what difference can it make? A couple of weeks ago, I got an email from somebody who works at GE. Big company in terms of acquisitions, they, now they've kind of slowed down. But for a long time while they were doing acquisitions, one of the things that GE would do is take their cost of capital and value target. This is one of the most sophisticated financial, I mean, they had a CFO a financial team which was sophisticated. They consistently used their cost of capital to value target companies. Lead me through what's going to happen. G has a low cost of capital or a high cost of capital? They have a pretty low cost of capital, partly because they're a diversified company and partly because they have a lot of debt. Their cost of capital is like 5.5%. So let's say they're valuing Activision. I don't know why they'd want to buy Activision. Risky company in a risky business. They project out the cash flows for Activision and then discount those cash flows back at their cost of capital, 5.5%. What's Activision going to look like to them? Incredibly cheap, right? In fact, whenever they look at risky business, their eyes are going to light up and say, that's cheap, that's cheap, that's cheap. And you keep buying these companies thinking they're cheap, you're going to destroy your company over time, which is effectively what GE managed to do over the last 15 or 20 years. This is predictable. You take a safe company's cost of capital, you value risky companies with it, what are you doing? You're subsidizing the risky companies for something that they had absolutely no role in creating. So don't use some weighted average of the beta the acquiring and the target company. This is about the target company. The beta you're going to use is the beta of the target company. So in this case, the beta that I use was the beta for electronic companies. Now comes a question where there can be some debate. To get the cost of equity for Harman Audio, I looked at where the revenues were today. The same way I did for any company. This is the revenue breakdown for Harman Audio. Not for Tata Motors again. This has nothing to do with Tata Motors. And based on where they get their revenues, I got a weighted average equity risk premium of 6.13%. You see why this can be debated? Because after this acquisition, it's possible that their geographical sales could shift if they're going to be become part of you know, Jaguar Land Rover. I didn't want to wrestle with it, I kind of left it at 6.13%. But this is where you could push and say maybe we should look at a new mix based on what, what Tata Motors has planned for them. For the debt ratio and the cost of debt, I just use Harman Audio's debt ratio and Harman Audio's cost of debt. And this again, people might find strange. You're saying, what if I can borrow money at a really low rate? What if Tata Motors could borrow money at a really low rate and there's excess debt capacity. What if they decided to fund this entire acquisition? Let's say 95% of the funding they get from debt at a really low cost. Why am I not putting in Tata Motors low cost of debt 
and debt capacity into the cost of capital calculation. First, what will happen if I do that? Do you, my cost of capital is going to go down or go up? It's going to drop to about 3%, right? It's going to push up my value. And if I pay that higher value, again, think about what I've just done. I've subsidized Tata, in this case, Harman Audio stockholders for what? For the fact that Tata Motors shareholders have built up this debt capacity and the cost of debt. Very simple rule in acquisition. Render unto the target company shareholders that which is theirs and not a penny more. So if you keep loading up the plate with things that you brought, bring to the table that have nothing to do with the target company, of course you're going to pay a bigger premium. But they have nothing to do with it. Why are you paying them this higher premium? I actually think I've made your life much simpler in an acquisition because here's what I'm saying. The acquiring company can come up with all kinds of strange looking financing mixes for an acquisition valuation. I'm just saying ignore them. Value the target company on the target company's beta, its capacity to carry debt, and its cost of debt, because this is about attaching a value to the target company. Any questions on the cost? So the basic cost of capital I end up with in US dollar terms for Harman Audio is about 9.67%. It's a US dollar cost of capital based on their beta, their debt ratio, their cost of debt. Now let's talk about the cash flows. I valued Harman Audio as a mature company. I'll, the reason I wanted to do that is I didn't want to make this an elaborate DCF exercise. You could build in 10 years of growth if you want to. Here I'm going to value it as a mature company. And the cash flows they had in the most recent year, I estimated looking at their operating income and taxes for the most recent year. So I pulled the numbers from, in, in, in effect, I'm going to build up a table just like I did for the Disney theme park, starting with the operating income, netting out taxes. Because remember, if it's a gigantic project, I should be treating it like a gigantic project. So there's their operating income, 313 million. They paid about 18% of that income in taxes. Their reinvestment, and remember, this is what they need to put in, just like capital expenditures in, a, in, a, in, a, in the theme park. This is the reinvestment that Harman Audio is putting in to keep growing for time. Their capex for the, for the year and acquisitions were about 206 million. The depreciation was about 128. So the depreciation is going to get added back. The capex is going to get subtracted out. And working capital is a big part of their business. They need to reinvest in working capital if they need to grow. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this information that you have for the entire company and convert it into something that looks just like the Disney theme park. So there's my expected operating income for 2014. There's my after-tax operating income. I add depreciation, subtract capex, subtract change in working capital. If that adjustment sounds familiar, that's exactly what I did for the theme park as well. The way you compute cash flows for a company is no different than the way you compute cash flows for an individual project. There's my cash flow for next year, 166.85 million. You see, you do only one year of cash flows. You know why I can get away with doing one year of cash flows? I just described this company as a mature company. What does that mean? I'm going to assume this 166.85 million in cash flow is going to grow at 2.75% a year forever. That's my risk free rate. Essentially, I've let the growth rate cap at that. My cost of capital is 9.67%. So if I use those three numbers, and that's all I need for a mature company, and that's why valuation is simple at mature companies, the value that I get for Harman Audio is 2.476 billion. At least it's operating assets. Because it's a company, it has a cash balance, I add the cash balance, and then I subtract out the debt, the value that I get for the equity is about 2.678 billion. Valued as a standalone company, the value that I get for Harman Audio is 2.678 billion. And Tata Motors would have had to pay 5.4 billion to buy the company, even if, they'd pay, even if they bought it at the market price. Forget about paying a premium. Does that mean it's a bad acquisition? If I stop right here and say there's nothing else in this acquisition, of course it's a bad acquisition. It's a negative net present value project. The net present value will be minus 2.75 billion. I'm not ready to stop now because there is potential synergy I haven't valued. I have to bring that in. Here's the question I have to ask. Is the value of synergy in this acquisition greater than 2.75 billion? If it is, hey, the deal makes sense. So we will value synergy. That's an entirely different process. But the first step in valuing an acquisition of target companies is value the target company as a standalone entity. Any questions about the mechanics here? 
So there's a currency choice issue and a cost of capital issue. Yes? At a lower rate. If you re refinance it at the existing rate, nothing changes, right? It has to, if it's at a lower rate, why were you able to refinance at a lower rate? You have the scale and you have the credit standings. Do you see what I mean by subsidization? Yeah. Let's say you're a triple A rated company and I'm a triple B rated company. You take over all my debt, you make my triple B rate become a triple A rate. You've lowered my cost of capital and if you use that lower cost of capital, you're gonna push up my value and then you pay that as a premium. My question is, why are you paying the premium? You're paying me for what? For the fact that you have a triple A rating. What business is it of mine? Why pay me for something that I had absolutely no role in creating? That's what I mean by subsidization, and it happens all the time. I've seen people value target companies using a, using a debt ratio of 95%. So how come? Because that's what they're using in the acquisition, 95% debt. This is amazing. If I'm a target company shareholder, my value is going to go through the roof. You're going to be paying me something that you shouldn't be paying me for the fact that you earned excess debt capacity in the past. So that's the part about rendering unto the target company that's, that which is theirs, but not a penny more. And exactly, right? So you have to ask what's mine is mine, what's yours is yours. I shouldn't be transferring my wealth to yours because I've earned this capacity from the past. Yes? target. Okay, that's a good question because that is actually a question where you could argue, did everybody get the question? I use the existing debt ratio for Harman Audio to get the cost of capital. Let's take an extreme scenario. Let's assume Harman Audio is run by very conservative management. What does that mean? They refuse to borrow money. Let's say they could borrow 30%. This is not some subsidy. This they could have used. They chose not to use. Could I revalue the company at the 30%? Yeah, and I'll get a higher value. What's that extra value? What should I call that? It's really nothing to do with synergy, right? Because you don't need two companies here. What's the other big word you see in acquisitions? Synergy and control. You know what control is? If a target company is badly managed and badly run and you can fix it, you can increase the value of the target company and that's a value of control. There's a value of control and a value of synergy. In this case, I've essentially taken, you know, but if you felt that Harman Audio was badly managed and badly run, you can value control first and then value synergy on top. The reason you want to separate the two is control has nothing to do with you as the acquiring company. Synergy is something you should demand a share of because you brought something to the table. So you can bring in a target debt ratio if you think the target company is under leverage. Be careful. It should be a debt ratio they can sustain on their own, not a debt ratio that's subsidized by you. Okay. Yes? No, it's got nothing to do with depressing the price. It's to get a fair value for the target company that you're not paying a premium for something that has nothing to do with them. Why is it depressing the price? If they do really well, I'm gonna pay them a high value, right? This has to do with not paying a premium for something that doesn't belong to them. Any other questions? So now let's, yeah, go ahead. That's what I'm getting. So that's another point where you can say, well, if the market's valuing it at 5.2 billion, maybe it's something in my valuation that I'm missing. Maybe there's high growth. That's a different challenge, right? So you can actually back out from, the, if you want to, for your target price, back out from the market price, almost reverse engineer a growth rate that'll give you the market price and say, that's going to be my base case. I'm assuming the market is right. The problem then is, if the market is wrong, you're paying a premium on top of a wrong price and if you think about it, if you're buying cash flows, that's what you're doing the acquisition for, what does it matter what the market thinks Snap is worth? If I'm buying Snap as a company, I should be buying it for the cash flows. So it's true the market price is higher than the cash flows, but you have to come up with a good cash flow reason to increase the value. You can't just use the fact that the market price is high, therefore, I'm gonna start with the market price plus. Market price plus acquisitions are a recipe for disaster if the market price already is too high, right? So you want to make sure that you're getting the cash flows. 
And that I'm willing to argue for. Maybe you should use a higher growth rate. Maybe a harmonious potential I haven't captured. But that's, I think, something you can look at without letting the market price drive everything you do. Any other questions? Now let's talk about some loose ends in, in valuation. I mean, so far, almost when you look at the Disney theme park, the Vale INR project, and the Harmon acquisition, they were independent projects. What I mean by that is you either took the project or you did nothing. So basically, we looked at the net present value, we compared it to zero. I want to talk about what happens when you have to compare two projects. Life is full of comparison. We have to, if you choose one, you can't do the other. I'll give you a very simple example. We're building a new house in San Diego. Every day my wife gets a call. Do you want to do this or do you want to do this? Do you want a fence that will last 25 years, it'll cost you 15000 Or do you want a fence that will fall over in five years, which will cost you 6000 Do you want flooring that will last the rest of eternity? Or do you want flooring that will... So you're given a choice. Do you want something cheaper that will last less time? And if you go purely on the cost, the lower, the shorter life choice will always be the better choice. So let's talk about mutually exclusive investments because a big chunk of what companies have to do, if they do one, they can't do the other. So what I'm going to do is actually take the scenario of mutually exclusive and use NPV and IRR and show you cases where using NPV will give you one, one ranking and using IRR will give you a different ranking. And with each one, I'm going to push you on why is this happening with this investment. And along the way, you're going to see that while both NPV and IRR are time-weighted incremental cash flow returns, they make some assumptions that can lead to different choices. So I'm going to take three cases. And with each case, I'm going to do the NPV and IRR for two projects. And they're mutually exclusive. You know what I mean by mutually exclusive, right? You do one, you can't do the other. And I'm going to ask you why the rankings are different. And we'll start easy. Okay? So when you look at projects with different lives, you can try to do accounting returns, compare the projects. You can compare the NPVs across projects. You can compare the IRRs across projects. And if you compare based on accounting returns, you're going to pick the project which earns a higher return on capital return equity. If you base it on IRR, you're going to pick the project which has a higher IRR. If you pick based on NPV, you're going to pick the project with a higher NPV. You're no longer comparing to zero, you're comparing two net present values. So here's my first example. I'm going to show you two projects that are very creatively named Project 1 and Project 2. So those are my cash flows. Take a look at them. They're four-year projects. They both have four-year lives. You have two, two. I'm going to compute the NPV and the IRR for both these projects. And let's see which, remember you can pick only one of these two. Let's see which project leads to which choice. To compute the IRR, of course, I have to do an IRR profile, right? So I did the IRR profile in the two projects. There's my project two, and that's pretty standard, right? As my discount rate goes up, my net present value goes down. The IRR for this project is about maybe 11%. I did project one. Notice a pattern here. It said initially, as I raise discount rates, my net present value actually goes up. It keeps going up. There's a point at which it peaks, and then it starts coming down. And again, so if you think about the IRR as the point at which you cross the x-axis, there are two internal rates of return for project one. This is a problem. It's a classic problem. It's a mathematical problem. It's not a financial problem. Let me explain why. If you look at these two projects, you know what an IRR is? It's a route to an equation. That's the way we don't ever think of it that way, but it's a route to an equation. There are cash flows you're solving for that route. What is it about project one that's giving you two routes to the equation, two internal rates of return? The cash flows are what? The cash flows, are what? But the cash flow sign changes on both projects, but on project one it changes twice, right? Initially, when you go from negative to positive and back from positive to negative. Every time your cash flows change signs in a project, you will have another internal rate of return. You think, what kind of project will have that? Let's say you have a 30 year project, a big infrastructure project, where every five years you've got to make a big investment in the project to keep it going. So, what are you going to have? Every fifth year, you're going to get a negative cash flow, right? So, you're going to get six cash flow sign changes for a 30 year project. So, guess what? You're going to have six internal rates of return for this project. Remember last session I talked about using the IRR function in Excel? 
I've always wondered how Excel decides when you have six IRRs, which one to tell you? And it has some very strange algorithms that I don't quite understand. Sometimes it gives me the middle number, sometimes a low number, sometimes. That's part of the reason why an NPV profile is better in those cases. But you're faced with a decision problem here. And here's what the decision problem is. If you look at the net present values, you get only one NPV for each project. But if you look at the internal rates of return, here's what you get. Project one has an internal rate of return of 6.6% and 36.55%, two internal rates of return. Project two has an internal rate of return of 12.8%. So what do we say, how do you pick between projects with IRR? If the IRR for a project is higher, you should pick it. So which one should I use for project one? Because if I use the 6.6%, I should pick project two. And if I use the 36.55%, it looks like I should pick project one. How do I decide which project to pick when I have more than one internal rate of return? Exactly. When you get more than one IRR, don't try to fix it. It's a problem that's not going to go away. Just compute the net present value. Because there's only one NPV for each project. Pick the project with a higher NPV. You know where this often comes up? If you're in private equity or VC, when investors invest in your fund, they want to know the internal rate of return they make on their investment. So they'll ask you to compute an IRR. Every year I get at least a, maybe 15 or 20 emails from people trying to compute the IRR. The problem is you, you have money coming in, money leaving as an investor. If you try to compute the IRR using the IRR function in Excel, it blows up on you. And every year the question I get asked is, how do I fix this? And the answer is you cannot. Just take the required return that you'd need to make over this period, given the risk of what you invested in, compute an NPV over that period and say, this is how much we made over and above the NPV over this period. Because when you have more than one IRR, IRRs become irredeemable. You really can't fix them. They're just, they've gone off the rails. So when you have, when you look at a project, one of the things I'd look at is, are there more than one sign change? If there's more than one sign change, sometimes you'll get lucky. The other IRR might be so far out, out there, 5,300% that you never get to see it, which is okay. Then you can act like it's not there. But if you get two internal rates of return that both sound plausible, just abandon IRR, go with NPV. Any questions on multiple IRR? So any project with multiple sign changes will have multiple IRRs. Let's move along. Let's try a second case. I'm going to show you two projects. Same lifetime again. Both have four-year lives. First project, I invest a million dollars up front. I get 350,000 in year one, 450,000 in year two, 600,000 in year three, and 750,000 in year four. Okay. I compute the net present value. I think I used a 10% discount rate. The net present value I get for project one is 467,000. The IR for project one, if I solve for the discount rate, is 33.66%. You see, big deal. The second project is a $10 million project. Remember, they're mutually exclusive. If I take project one, I can't take project two. If I take project two, I can't take project one. $10 million project, I get 3 million, 3.5 million, 4.5 million, and 5.5 million. The net present value for project B is 1.358 million. The IRR is 21%. Here the choice is stark, right? If I base my decision based on IRR, I'll go with project one. If I base my decision based on NPV, I'll go with project two. So I'm going to put the choice to you. If you had to pick between these two projects, and I've worked out the numbers, how many of you would pick project A because it has a higher internal rate of return? Nobody? OK. Now, so you pick project A because it's a higher IRR. So you've spent one million. Why do you pick project A? Exactly. So basically, what's your biggest fear? I'm going to ask that of the other side as well. So you take the small project because it is a higher IRR, because you say, I don't want to tie up all my capital for the year. What's your biggest concern you should have for the rest of the year? What if no other projects come along, right? Then you're going to have 9 million sitting around. So if you take the high IRR project, what you worry about is, are there further projects coming along? How many of you would pick the second project because a higher NPV? Because I'm going to ask you the same question. Yeah. And what would your biggest concern be? Well, even if it performs your expectations, you've used up $10 million of your capital, right? 
What if another great project comes along? You can already see that for UDUs and PV, you got to say, look, I have capital whenever I need it. But let's say only $15 million of capital invest. You use up $10 million on the first project. Another $10 million or a $15 million project comes along, which is a great project. You now are not going to be able to take it because you locked up too much capital in the first project. I, I know that in every corporate finance book, the answer is absolute and categorical. When you have to pick, you should always pick based on what? NPV, foundations, you were probably told that. Bad advice, throw it out. Because implicit in that advice is also the assumption that capital is open, accessible, and easy to get. If you can always raise capital, of course you should base on NPV. Why? Because if another great project comes along, what do I assume you can do? Go out and raise more capital. The question of whether you should use NPV or RR is very closely tied to whether you think you have a capital rationing constraint. What does that mean? There's only a certain amount of capital you can invest because you either have no access to markets beyond that, you're a small firm, you're a high growth firm, you're a private firm, you don't have an unlimited capital. I understand why you'd want to use IRR because you want to maximize the bang for your buck. You want to put your capital, you get the highest rate of return, but this is going to be the case only if you're in a really good business. Why does that matter? What does it mean when I say really good business? There are lots of projects with positive net present value. So you're not worried about, can I invest the nine million? And you have a capital rationing constraint. So if you ask me, should I use NPV or IRR? Or if I asked you, should I use NPV or IRR? You need to ask me two questions, right? One is, are you a company which faces capital rationing? And I might have no idea what you're talking about. I'm say, are you a small company or a big company? A private company or a public company? Oh, by the way, what market are you in? So say Argentina, what are you gonna say? Your capital ration, use your capital wisely. So if you're in a capital ration environment with good projects, of course you should use IRR. If you're not capital rationed, either because you're a big company, you have access to capital, then I think it makes sense to focus on NPV. Do you think most, yeah, go ahead. We'll talk about that separately. I don't think that's as much an issue yet with this investment, but we'll talk about that implicit assumption because when the IRRs are this, this different, the 33% is going to beat the 21%, whatever reinvestment assumptions you make. But that's a good point. We'll come back to that as the third case. Okay? But let me kind of zero in on capital rationing. Do you think most companies face capital rationing or don't face capital rationing? Most companies face capital rationing. Why? We talked about some of the reasons, right? They're small, they can't access markets. They're private, they can't access market. They're in emerging markets, they can't access markets. But if you use that criteria, you took the S&P 500, none of those companies should face a capital rationing constraint, right? I mean, how can you as Google with a straight face tell me, I have a capital rationing constraint? Or Apple, I have a cap what capital rationing constraint? You could buy three countries with your cash balance, <laughs> $250 billion. So, but for whatever reason, if you took the S&P 500, about three quarters of them claim to have a capital rationing constraint. Why? Why do companies which have access to capital markets claim to have a capital rationing constraint? Anybody? When I say access to capital markets, what I'm assuming you're willing to do if you have to take a big project. You're willing to borrow money and you're willing to, you can't just borrow money because that'll get you out of kill. You have to be willing to raise new equity, right? Already I've opened the door to why many companies have a capital rationing constraint. Raise new equities, equity, what do you have to do? You have to issue new shares. And the minute within these companies you talk about issuing new shares, what comes out of the closet? The delusion bogeyman, right? Saying you can't do that, that's gonna increase your number. It's a stupid reason not to issue shares. It's a self-inflicted constraint and in fact, if you look at the percentage of companies which have capital rationing constraints, about 60% of these companies, the capital rationing constraint is self-imposed. It's because of something that they refuse to do that has no basis in logic, but it has some basis in I'm afraid to do that. So what I'm saying is when you run into a company and they say we have a capital rationing constraint, and most of them will, we can't raise more, ask them why. Find out what their self-imposed constraint is and push on it. When they say we can't issue shares, why? 
Because we'll have more shares outstanding. That's mathematically always true. Why can't I issue shares to take a great project? I'll have more shares outstanding, but if I take a great project, what else should go up? My income should go up, my earnings per share should go up. This notion that issuing new shares is something you should never do is deeply embedded in US firms. The reason I say US firms is European firms actually are willing to make rights issues. I'm mean, a Deutsche Bank shareholder, and the way they're going to raise the eight and a half billion in equity is with the rights issues. So last week I got the notice that as a shareholder, I was going to get rights to buy additional shares in Deutsche. You know what that rights price is going to look like? They haven't set the price. But is it going to be higher than the current stock price or lower than the current stock price? They want everybody to exercise the rights, so it's going to be set at half of the stock price. You think, what if you don't want to have more Deutsche Bank shares, which is the case with me? I have enough Deutsche Bank in there. I don't want any more pain. What can I do? They actually have opened up a market where I can sell my right to somebody else. You know the one thing I should not do? Is forget all about the rights issue. In which case, I'm screwed and I deserve to be screwed because here's what's going to happen. Other people are going to exercise the rights and when they exercise the rights, what's going to happen to the stock price? It's going to go down and I'm going to end up holding the same number of shares. I. So if you get a rights issue letter from, I usually throw away letters from companies. This is one of those letters you don't want to throw away. And it actually is a sensible way of raising equity. You know why? Because I don't have to pay an investment banker 6% of the proceeds. Rights issue, it's, it, the costs of making a rights issue are far smaller than making an issue at, the, at today's price where I have to get a banker and I have to get underwriting. I don't need that with the rights issue. It's a much simpler process to, but that's the self-imposed constraint that leads many companies into that capital rationing corner. Any questions about capital rationing? Now, if you are capital rationed and you worry about this reinvestment rate assumption in IRR, that, there is a way in which you can adapt NPV to make it a scale number. You know what I mean by scale number? The problem I'm having is I have a $1 million project and a $10 million project. Because NPV is a dollar value, almost by definition, the bigger the project, the higher the net present value is going to be. A $100 million project will always have a higher positive net, they're both good projects, a higher positive net present value than a million dollar project. So here's how I can deal with it. I can take the NPV I got for these two projects and divide each NPV by the initial investment on that project. So the first project is a million dollar investment, the NPV is 467,937. That translates into what's called a profitability index. It sounds fancy, but just the NPV scale for the size of the project. What does it allow me to do? If I have a capital rationing constraint then, rather than pick the project with a higher NPV, I'm going to go with the project that delivers the highest NPV for every dollar invested. That's one way to think about this, is I'm investing a dollar, what is the NPV I'm getting per dollar investment, and project A is much better than project B. So any questions on NPV versus IRR with different scales? Yes. That's, what would you do? What's the easiest way? If staying in the present value world, what's the simplest way to do with the fact that, you, did everybody get a question? What if you have invested a million in year one and a million in year three? Or right now, a million in year zero and a million in year three. Because we're living in a present value world, what I'll do is I'll take the present value of your initial investment, make that to your denominator. Okay? So just stay in the present value framework, just make it a scale value for whatever the present value of your initial investment has to be on the project, it'll still work. You had a question? Yeah. Is that true? Generally. Yeah, the two will be the same, except when we start talking about reinvestment. That's where you can start to get they're pretty close, yeah. You can start to get them flipping. Any other questions? Let's take a third case. Okay, so here I'm going to take two projects which have exactly the same initial investment, so I can't blame scaling differences now. They have different patterns for cash flows. The first project has higher cash flows up front and lower later, and the second project has lower cash flows up front and higher later. The NPV for project one is 1.191 million. The NPV for project two is 1.35. So based on the NPV, project two is better than project one. Based on the IRR, Project one is better than project two. They're both time-weighted measures. So it can't just be that the cash flows are in the future. They're both the same scale. 
Why am I getting different answers on the NPV and the RR? Now you can bring up the reinvestment rate assumption, right? When I do NPV, take the first project. I invest 10 million now, right? I get 5 million at the end of year one. What do I do with that 5 million? That's cash coming in. Where does it get put? It has to be invested somewhere, right? Making a rate of return. With the IRR, what am I assuming I can make as my rate of return on that 5 million? I'm assuming that I can, that I can reinvest at 21.41%. That is an implicit assumption with IRR that we might as well make explicit. When I get those intermediate cash flows, I'm going to find other projects that make 21.41%. Whereas with NPV, what do I assume I can reinvest that 21.51%, the 5, 5 million at? At whatever my cost of capital or cost of equity or discount rate is. Which do you think is a safer assumption? Assuming you can reinvest at your cost of capital or cost of equity, or assuming you can reinvest at your internal rate of return? What do you think it is? And why? What's our definition of cost of capital? It's an opportunity cost. It's what I can make on other investments of. It, almost by definition, if I've computed the cost of capital of your company of 8%, what am I saying? If I find another company with similar risk, this is what I need to make. So cost of capital, almost by definition, has to be out there if you've done it right as an opportunity cost. You see the problem with IRR? I've seen actually private equity invest, uh, no, private equity funds present the IRR for an investment at 50%. It's a 10-year investment. The IRR is 50%. Even if every single cash flow that they've predicted comes in on the spot, you get exactly the cash flow. At the end of the 10 years, you count up your money and you look at what rate of return you made on your total investment. It's not going to be 50%. Why? Because the cash flows you got in year one and year two and year three, you had to find other investments you don't have this fountain of 50% return projects. If you do, by all means, use a 50% IRR. High internal rates of return should come with red flags next to them, especially when you have big intermediate cash flows, because they assume not only that this project is a good project, but that there are other projects out there that can deliver the rates of return that are similar to what you've computed for this project. That's the reinvestment rate assumption, and that's what's causing the two to give you different answers. And in this case, I would suggest going with the NPV. It's a much safer assumption to make because you're not making that assumption that you can keep finding projects that make 20, 21, 22% returns. So is everybody clear on the mechanics? I mean, you don't see this when you hit the PV button on your calculator, but it is implicit every time you use the PV button that all those intermediate cash flows get discounted at some rate. And we're making very different assumptions with NPV and IRR. So bottom line is when you look at NPVRR, that's fine. You don't have to do anything fancy. But if you look at an IRR and it's giving you a different decision rule than the NPV, this might be part of the promise because of the intermediate cash flows. Okay. I've actually seen entire books on internal rate of return mechanics, how to fix the internal rate of return when things go wrong. Okay. Usually, if, I, if you ask me to write this book, I'll have only one sentence in it, which is, if the internal rate of return stops working, use the NPV, end of book. But for some reason, people want percentage rates of return. And one of the things they try to fix is this reinvestment assumption. So if I wanted to stay in the IRR world and make a reinvestment rate assumption that's reasonable, is there a way I could do that? What do I need to do about the intermediate cash flows? For instance here, I have an investment of a billion dollars up from 300, 400, 500, and 600 million in my cash flows for the next four years. If I run a traditional IRR, I get 24.89%, which assumes that when I get 300 million in year one, I can reinvest it for the remaining three years at 24.89. Cash flow in year two, reinvest for two years. I don't like that assumption, so here's what I change. Let's say my cost of capital is 15%. At the end of year one, I get 300 million, right? I reinvested at 15% for the remaining three years. So it's almost like I have a bank account for my cash flows. I take my intermediate cash flows and rather than assume that they will reinvest at the internal rate of return, I reinvest them at the cost of capital. At the end of the fourth year, I count up my cash flows in my bank account. I get a total cash flow of all of the cash flows over time of 2.16 billion. 
I can now compute an IRR using an initial investment of a billion and an ending cash flow of 2.16 billion. And that internal rate of return is called a modified internal rate of return is 21.23%. Why is it lower? Because my cost of capital is lower than my internal rate of return. So you're going to see your internal rate of return shift towards your cost of capital. So it's a very simple fix if you insist on using IRR and staying with it. This is a simple fix to the reinvestment rate problem that will allow you to continue to use internal rate of return without that, that I think, almost you know, the, the, the bad assumption of reinvestment at the IRR. Any questions on? Yes. That no, no, the fifteen percent is your cost of capital, right? So basically, it is what you can reinvest at. Future values. Exactly, exactly. So everybody get that point when you once you've gone this route. It'll be, if you're doing it in your calculator, you'll have minus a billion in year zero, zero cash flow in year one, zero cash flow in year two, zero cash flow in year three, 21, 16, year four. Don't end up double counting. You know what I mean, Robert? If you count the cash flows and the 21, 16, your IRR is going to be like 40%, because your money is then making money in ways I don't even know how. Okay? So if you decide to go this route, you'll just end up with two cash flows at either end of the project. But it's a simple fix to the RR problem. So don't again make it more fancy than it has to be. Remember again intuitively what you're trying to do. Okay. Any other questions? So let's kind of summarize why NPV and IRR can give you different answers. First is an NPV is unique. There's going to be only one NPV for a project. I've never been able to compute more than one NPV for a project with a given discount rate. Cash flows, discount rate, you're done. You can have more than one IRR. The NPV will tilt you towards bigger projects. IRR will tilt you towards smaller projects. That's a simple reason. A percentage rate of return will tilt you towards smaller projects. Now, which one is better? Depends on what kind of capital rationing constraint you face. If I go into Apple and I see them using IRR, I'm going to freak out. But if I go into a small company and I see them using IRR, that's exactly what I'd expect. And finally, that reinvestment assumption is kind of an implicit assumption. Be, think about it explicitly, because it will allow you to make sense of why some high IRR projects are not going to deliver what the computed internal rate of return is. Now let's make things a little messier. Let's say now, up till now the projects I've compared have all been of the same life, four-year project against a four-year project. Let's assume. I gave you two projects. They're mutually exclusive again. Project A has a five-year life. Project B has a 10-year life. So I give you the cash flows. I compute the net present value of project A and the IRR of project A. Net present value of project B and IRR of project B. The IRRs I can compare. They're actually, you know, they don't depend on life. But when I look at the NPV, see why NPV is going to tilt you towards longer life projects? Why do you have a higher NPV for the 10-year project? It's because of five extra years of cash flows, right? If I pick based just on the NPV, this is going to be a no-brainer. I will always pick the longer life project. In fact, this actually gets flipped around. The old days, and you don't get them anymore, you used to get these magazine subscription renewals. You remember those? You can renew for one year at $20, two years at $38, three years at $54. This is if they knew their math. Sometimes you get offers like one year at 20, two years at 42, three years at 66. This makes your life much simpler. But you're given a choice of, would you rather renew for one year at $20, two years at a $19 average, or three years at an $18 average? It's very similar to what we're getting here. The total cost is always going to be greater for the three year. But there, how did we deal with it? I mean, without doing present value tables, which you don't want to do with a magazine subscription. To make them comparable, you divide it by two and three to get now. I'm going to push you towards the same place with NPVs. I can't compare the NPV of a five-year project to a 10-year project. If I don't have much time, what could I do? I could divide the NPV of the first project by five and the NPV for the second project to get like an annual net present value. The only problem with that is that's not consistent with the present value word. You don't get the same cash flow. So here are the two ways you can try to deal with this problem. What's the life of my first project? It's five years. The life of my second project is 10 years. This is a math problem, right? If I want to make the math problem go away, what should I do with the first project? Do it twice. 
if I do that. This is like rocket science, right? You're getting two 10-year projects by doing the first project twice. So that's called replication. And I'll present it to you, but I'll also tell you that if that's the only way you deal with multiple life projects, you're set up for a fall, and you'll see why. The second way you can deal with this is you can take the net present values and make them into annual amounts. He said, we can't do that, you can't divide by five. I can convert them into annual amounts using a present value table, it's called an annuity, basically converting the net present value into an annuity. Annuities are more directly comparable. So let's try the replication first. So here's what I did, I took the first project, I replicated it twice, what does that mean? At the end of five years, I reinvest another th billion dollars in the project, and I get five more years of life. The net present value project A replicated 693 million, the net present value project B replicated is 478 million. This I can compare. Project A is better than project B. But I am making an assumption, which is what? At the end of five years, I can recreate exactly the same project, right? Let's say this is the only way you deal with different life projects. And you get to quiz two, which is coming a week from Wednesday. You know what I'm gonna ask you to compare? 11 year project and a 13 year project. So what would you need to do to get their lives equal? I picked two prime numbers. 11 times 13 will give you 143 years. So if you can do the first project 13 times and the second project 11 times, imagine drawing those cash flows across in your quiz page, you're going to get the right answer, but you're not going to be done in 30 minutes. This is not a very effective way or in a very efficient way of dealing with different lives. I'm going to give you a second way which will give you exactly the same answer without doing the replication. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take each of my net present values. Right, the first project is a net present value of 442 million in a life of five years, right? I'm going to ask a very simple question. If instead of the net present value of 442 million, I offered you an annual amount for the next five years, how much would you ask for as an annuity? So what I do is I take the net present value, I look for that annuity that will give me a net using this, the five-year life and my cost of capital. I come up with 122.62 million. You say, what does it even mean? 122.62 million a year for five years is exactly the same as getting a net present value of 442 million up front. They're equivalent in present value terms. So this is kind of a little more sophisticated than dividing by five. It just spreads the money out across five years, makes them into annuities. I do the same thing for the second project, but now I use a 10-year life, and it turns out that in the second project, you'd be willing to accept $84.6 million every year for the next 10 years instead of the 478 million. I've converted the net present values into annuities. Those annuities can actually be compared. So last week when I got this call on my fence, this is what I did. They're pretty expensive. Fences are not cheap. So basically one was a 25-year life and the other was a 15-year life. I could have tried replicating, but that would have required going through, what, 150 years? I'm not doing that. Besides, I don't plan to live for 150 years. Frankly, I don't care if the fence falls apart in 57 years. It's not, I'm not there anyway. So I converted those costs into annuities. So there's an upfront cost in both. I have the life of both. I had to come up with some kind of a discount rate, right? Which had to be pretty low because I need a fence. I have a dog. The dog escapes all the time. So low discount rate. So basically, you were able to convert that upfront cost into an annual cost. That annual cost can be compared across those two options. Any questions? So if you are thinking in calculated terms, which is where many people's minds tend to go when you talk about present value, what am I doing in, the, in this case? What are the buttons I'm hitting? I'm hitting the PV button and entering 442 million. I'm hitting the N button and hitting five years. I'm hitting the R button hitting 12%. What's the last button I hit? I hit the payment button and I should get the annuity. That's all it is, that I'm reversing the process and using the present value to convert into a payment. Just make sure you clear all the registers, please, before you do any of this stuff, because God only knows what you've already stored in those registers. So that's all you're doing is converting a present value into a payment. Any questions about comparing different lives? Yeah. That's exactly right. That is it. And if you, do, if you don't want to make that assumption, you have to make it explicit. You know what I mean? The replication case, I invested a billion, do uh, or a billion dollars at the end of year five and got the same cash flows. Let's say you feel that this is a declining technology. That at the end of five years when you reinvest, you have to invest a billion, but your cash flows are going to be 30% lower. 
you can actually make it explicit. So if you feel technologies are shifting and that your choice will shift, then you have no choice but to do some kind of replication. Because when you do the annuities, you're assuming replication at the same level. So, you know, this actually shows up when you get a job offer too, right? A three-year job offer where you get that high pay where you got, it's not quite renewable, but you know, at the end of three years, you might have a job, you might not. Or you get that nice solid job offer where you know you're going to have 20 years. Of, you know. And you have to make some assumption about what happens after year three, but you can't just compare what you're going to make over three years over what you're going to make over 20 years. It just doesn't make sense. So this is actually a technique that's incredibly useful in making choices where cash flows are concerned. Almost every choice has cash flows concerned. So now that I've described all these different ways of analyzing projects, we started with accounting returns, right? Remember the return on invested capital I computed for the theme park? Then we went to payback, which was a way of checking for risk. Then NPV and IRR, and we did the profitability index, which is the NPV. If you were the CFO of a company and you had to pick a decision rule, I want you to think about which one you're going to pick. You say, why can't I do all five? Of course, in a spreadsheet, you can compute all five. But you know why that's not going to be enough, right? Because ultimately, you've got to make choices. So the first thing I want you to start thinking about is how would I make the choice and what's going to go into it? What company are you CFO of? If you're a CFO of a young startup in a high growth company, the way you're going to make these choices and what you're going to add as constraints is going to be very different than if the CFO of Walmart. There's no one right answer. You have to think through what's right for your company. So I'm going to close off with at least a sense. And this is actually the last survey I saw was in 98, but I'll give you some updates based on informal surveys done first. So what these surveys have done is they've asked CFOs at big companies. These aren't small companies. What their primary way of picking projects is. What's their primary me mechanism? In 1976, 54% of companies, the primary way they pick projects was accounting return on capital return equity. Why? In 1978, if you took 500 CFOs, you put them in a room, you asked them what kind of background they had, what would you have got as an answer? Almost every single one of them were accountants working through. That's the way you became a CFO of a company, is you came down the accounting ranks. So kind of understandable that they stayed true to what they felt most comfortable with. You moved to 1986. Did I get the numbers right? No, I'm sorry. 1976, 53.6% user IRR. Accounting return was said next high is 25%. So IRR already made to the ranks, but no, people didn't want to use NPV. You get to 1986, accounting return has dropped from 25 to 8%. So people are less likely to use accounting returns. IRR has dropped a little bit. NPV has made a big jump. Now, if you are logical and you think about logical rationale, you say that means capital rationing constraints eased up between 76 and 86. I don't think that's the answer. Something else is going on. Right? What else do you think explains a jump in NPV? Maybe people, more, too many people are taking corporate finance classes and being told NPV is the right. Hey, don't underestimate that. You come through school and they're told NPV every single time. Maybe that explains part of the jump. But here's the interesting other jump. What's the other? If you're thinking people are getting more sophisticated, here's my counter evidence. What's happening to payback, which is, after all, the least sophisticated way of analyzing projects. It's gone from 9 to 19%. For whatever reason, in 1986, people were far more concerned about getting their cash back quickly than they were in 76. What might explain that? What would happen? A yeah. lot of leverage. And you see why leverage can push you towards payback? When you borrow a lot of money to fund your company, what's the first thing, the biggest thing on your mind every year? What do you have to make sure? That you get enough cash flow. Forget about NPVs or projects. If you don't make it through your three, who cares what the NPV is? So the more concerned you get about cash flows being paid back quickly because you have interest in principal payments, the more you're going to be looking at front-ended cash flows, which is what payback does. So as you move leverage, you start to see payback kind of rise up the ranks. And that's kind of surprising when you think about it. It's a simplistic approach, but you can see why people focused on it. And in fact, it dropped back a little bit in 98, and PV continued its climb. The most recent analyses I've seen suggest that you know, the, this trend has continued, NPV and IRR, but accounting return on capital stays stubbornly in there. It doesn't quite disappear. It's in fact made somewhat of a comeback since 1998. 
because of this focus on return on invested capital at companies. But as you look at these approaches, again, think about it. There's nothing, I wouldn't say any of these are bad approaches or any of these are good approaches. If you're using them, I'm going to look at how you use them to make a judgment on. I've seen people use NPV really badly. And I've seen people use accounting return on capital really well. I'd much rather that you return on capital well than net present value badly. Just the fact that you have an NPV at the bottom doesn't make it a good analysis. Okay? So think about the different approaches and think through the consequences. Yes? It's not even that it's unpopular, it's kind of an add-on, right? You do the NPV, you divide by the initial investment, neither fish nor fowl, you know, you're not really, you don't even know what to call it. You get up in front of a group of people and the profitability index is, you know, and they say, what? So there is this unfamiliarity people have. So it's really never made it out of the rank. So if you're using IRR, you're 90% of the way there. They're not getting that many differences. It's only when you get big projects versus small projects. It's mutually exclusive projects where it makes a difference. So maybe there aren't that many mutually exclusive projects. One project is huge and the other project is really, really small. Right? Let's talk about side costs and side benefits. Remember I said a good measure of return should have all of this other stuff already embedded in there? Let's face it, there's almost no big company where a project is entirely standalone. What do I mean by that? If Disney builds a new theme park in Shanghai, it doesn't start from scratch. Why? Because it uses personnel it already has in the Hong Kong theme park to staff the Shanghai theme park. It might even use some infrastructure, a ride that it created in Hong Kong that's not working very well. So when you think about big projects, some of the resources that you use, you already own that you're transferring to this project. You have to think about the side costs you create for the rest of the company when you do it. You also have this potential for side benefits. By taking this project, you get cash flows elsewhere. If Disney builds that Shanghai theme park, as it has, it is entirely possible that as Chinese start to come into the theme park, they're more likely to watch Disney movies. Disney's had a huge problem getting its movies to do as well in China as it, they should, given the, the, the number of people who should be able to come in. Maybe this will make a difference, side costs and side benefits. So I'm going to take some of these side costs and side benefits and break them down. First, I'm going to come up with this, this category called opportunity cost. Sounds fancy, but here's what I mean. When you're a company, you borrow resources to put onto new projects. A uh, warehouse you might already own that is half empty that you decide to use for this project. Land that you already own that you know, might as well use this for the project. If you treat those resources as free, because you've already paid for them, you're going to be taking a lot of projects you shouldn't even be touching. Because the reality is, that land, even though you're not using it, has an opportunity cost. Those people you borrowed from the Hong Kong theme park have some, some, something they were doing at the theme park that now has to be filled in by other people. So I'm going to take you through a few examples of opportunity costs, and I'd like you to help me put a number on them. Here's the first one. Remember the Disney theme park? I gave you all the numbers for the Rio theme park. Let's assume that the hotels they're going to build for this theme park are going to be on land that Disney bought a few years ago. When it was thinking about the theme park, it bought this land. The land is sitting around. So if this theme park gets developed, they're going to build the hotels on that land. But if this theme park is not developed, here's what Disney plans to do. It plans to sell the land for $40 million. That land right now has a book value which is much lower, $5 million. But if this theme park does not get invested in, you're going to sell off the land for 40 million. So my question is, I'm doing the spreadsheet for the theme park. After all, that's what my analysis is. I'm using land that I already own. So when I go to that initial investment, I put land. My question is, what do I put as my cost for the land? And here are the choices. I can ignore the cost of the land because after all, I own it already. There's really no explicit cash flow. I'm not paying for the land. I could put in the book value of the land, which is five million, which I already have in books. I'm transferring it. That's the accounting transfer. I can put in the 40 million that I could get by selling the land. Or maybe there's some loose end that I missed here, which will give me a different cost. So let's start with the top. How many of you would ignore the cost of the land? And why not? Why, why should I, no, why should I not ignore? Why should I, what happens if I ignore the cost of the land? I'm treating it as a free resource. That's going to make my project look better, but it's not quite fair, right? So really the question is, should I do the book value 
or the market value? Which one do you think I should go with, book or market? I should go with market, but there is one small other cash flow. That, so let's say I sell the land. Right? This is the what will what will happen if I take the project? What will happen if I don't? If I don't take the project, I'm going to sell the land, right? Right after I sell the land, what am I going to get as a cash flow? I'm going to get 40 million as a cash flow. Do I get to keep the entire 40 million? Why not? Because I have a capital gain. How do I know I have a capital gain? My book value is 5 million. I sell for 40 million. I have a capital gain. And once I have a capital gain, what do I need to do? I need to pay taxes. If my tax rate were 20%, I have to pay 20% of 35 million. Not the 40 million, not the 5 million, but of the difference, which gives me a tax of 7 million. That goes as a cash outflow. My net cash flow, if I don't take this project, is going to be the 40 million I get as a cash inflow minus the 7 million I have to pay in taxes. I'm going to, in my initial investment, show a cost for the land of 33 million. And if you're one of those very, you know, you're going to say, look, I'm not getting paying for this land. How come there's a cost there? Because this is what will happen if I don't take the project. It's an incremental cash flow. That same test. So the 33 million will become the cost of the land. Any questions on that? So that is an opportunity cost where if I don't use that resource in the project, I'm going to sell it off. It's actually the easiest of the opportunity costs to deal with. Let's move up the ladder. Let's suppose I'm looking at Bookscape, and let's say Bookscape decides that they're going to invest in an online retail business because their growth is slowing, Amazon is eating their lunch. So here's what I give you. I tell you the revenues from the first year in this investment. So basically, the, the initial investment is going to be a million. That initial investment is going to be depreciated over four years down to a salvage value of nothing. The revenues in the first year are going to be one and a half million. They'll grow 20% in year two and 10% in the following years. The costs of the books that I'll be selling, so this is the cost of goods sold, is 60% of my revenues. I'm going to hire employees, and the employees are going to cost me 150000 in year one, grow 10% for the following three years. So up till now, it looks like a conventional project. Okay? The working capital basically is going to be 10% of the revenues, and I'm going to make that investment. So let's look at the cash flows from starting this online venture. Okay? With a tax rate of 40%, I'm going to come up with the cash flows. I now need to come up with the cost of capital to, to apply this. Here's how I went through the cost of capital. I started with an unlevered beta for being an online retailer, as opposed to what? An unlevered beta for being a retailer. That's how I got the original cost of equity and capital for Bookscape, but that was when I was doing a cost of capital for the traditional bookstore. But because it's online retail, I get a higher beta. The beta that I used was an unlevered total beta. I know it's been way, way, way back in the past. Remember what the total beta was? It's a private company. They're not diversified. I scale up the beta to reflect the risk. My unlevered beta is 3.02. I use the debt to equity ratio of book retailers. I end up with a levered beta of 3.41 and a cost to capital for this particular investment. I'm staying true to that notion of my discount rate for a project should reflect the risk of the project, not the risk of the company taking the project. My cost to capital for this project is 18.12%, much higher than the 10.3% I computed earlier. Why? Because it's a riskier project. It's not a traditional bookstore investment. Here are my cash flows. I projected out my revenues and my expenses. Now we do the cash flows. The net present value of this investment, if I just stop based on the cash flows, looks positive, 76735 So if I were doing a conventional NPV, I'd say take the investment, go for this expansion. It's good for you. Your value as a business will increase by 76000 So up till now, conventional project, incremental cash flows, cost of capital, net present value. Here's where I'm going to introduce some side costs. Remember, it's a small business. If I start an online retail business on the side, I'm not going to start from scratch. I'm going to try as best as I can to use my existing bookstore resources to cover some of those costs. And here are the two additional costs that I'm going to bring into the picture. So hold on to the NPV of 76,735 because you already have it. It's positive, right? So it's in positive net present value. Here are the two additional costs. The first is, I already have a manager for this bookstore. He's doing his job. I'm going to ask him to also take care of the online bookstore. This is going to increase the number of hours he's going to work. And to be fair, I said, look, I'll give you a pay raise if you can do this. And I'm going to raise this pay, which is 100000 right now, to 120000 to account for the fact that he has to work more time. 
So what's the incremental effect of this online store? I'm going to increase his salary by 20,000. I can't ignore that. That's a direct consequence of this. And that, 20, uh, that, that salary is going to grow 5% a year, so that incremental cost is going to build up over time. Here's the second one. They have an office in this bookstore that right now is not fully utilized. And that, what they're going to do is use that office, which has records stored, as the place where they're going to run this online bookstore from. But those records that are stored there have to be stored somewhere else. And let's assume that you can find a bank vault and put these records somewhere. It'll cost you $1,000 a year to rent. So there are two side costs, right? One is this higher pay for the general manager. The other is I've got to find some other place to put these records. So I computed the present value of these costs. So let's start with the additional expense. I discounted the additional expense of 20,000 in additional salary at 18.12%. Why? Because this guy is now working on the online store. I should be using a discount rate that reflects the risk of that additional cash flow. That, net pre that present value that I get reflects the additional salary. For the $1,000 a year that I'm paying in extra costs, remember it's an expense, I'm allowed a tax deduction. So I net out the tax deduction. Basically, I do that for both. And the present value of that cost is one. 1610 So I have two additional costs. One is the 34352 in additional salaries, the 1610 And here, if you insisted on using a different discount rate because you say that's storage cost, why am I applying an online bookstore, I'll concede that to you. Maybe you should be using the 10.3% cost of capital, just that slice of cash flows. And that is something you should always be willing to consider when you have side costs and side benefits is some of those might have lower risk or higher risk than your overall project. And it's, there's nothing wrong with using a different discount rate on those cash flows. So the sum of those net present values, if I bring them in, my net present value is still positive at 40,000. So even with the side cost considered, this is a good project. One of the nice things about NPV is you can do things in slices like I have. I took the regular project and then I brought the side cost separately. Or you can bring in the cash flows from those side costs into my regular cash flows and compute the net present value as one big NPV, I will get exactly the same answer. For those of you working on the case, which all of you should, I mean, there are all these different strands of cash flows, right? And what this is telling you is you can take sets of cash flows and discount them separately and add them all up at the end, or bring all the cash flows into a big cash flow table and do one net present value at the end. The one disadvantage of doing it the second way is you get to use one discount rate. So if you want to use different discount rates for other streams of cash flows, then do it with the, the deconstructed way, with different pieces getting different discount rates. But it does mean that you can either do NPV and I can value, for, and, and this, the way this shows up in valuation is if you gave me a company like GE, I can value each business separately and add up the values at the end, or I can value the whole company together at a consolidated cost of capital. I should get the same answer if I do things right. And which one I do will depend on whether I have the information to break it down in pieces. Any questions on this? Let's close with a final side cost. Let's assume that in the Vale example, they're going to use their existing distribution system. Remember that iron ore mine we did, no, which was a positive net present value? They're going to use their existing distribution system to service the production. So they're not going to build a new distribution system. The guy who's going to be the new mine manager, obviously wants the mine open, comes to you and says, look, we already own this distribution system. We can't sell it. It's not like the land that I had. Should I attach a zero cost? To the fair. I'm using excess capacity, it's something I already own that I can't sell. No. What do you think the answer to that is? You're facing, a, I think, a version of this on your case. I want you to start thinking about how to answer. When is it costless? Yeah. No market for the capacity right now, or no market for the capacity over, li over the lifetime of the project. If, so let's take that extreme case. If you have excess capacity you're using and you will never be using it over the lifetime of this project, then obviously there is no cost to excess capacity. You can't sell it, you can't rent it, you can't do it. If you run into this problem of if I use it right now, you might have no cost because you have excess capa capacity, but that capacity is being used by something else. And at some point in time, you realize that by using this excess capacity, you will have to 
either cut back on production or build new capacity, that becomes an effect of this project, right? It's an incremental effect. So here's the way I think through this because it helps me kind of break it down. First question I ask is, if I don't add this new project, what will happen to my capacity, right? So act like there's no project, work through the capacity. Then the second question you're going to ask is, if I do take this project, what will happen to capacity? And presumably, because you're using some of that capacity, what will happen? Is you'll run out of capacity sooner rather than later. So the first option, you might run out of capacity in year 11. The second option, you're going to run out of capacity in year 6. And here's the third question I'm going to push you on. Once you run out of capacity, what do you plan to do? You say, what do you mean? What do I have to build new capacity? Not necessarily, right? In some cases, you might decide not to build new capacity and actually cut back on production on one of your products. Which one? The less profitable one, presumably. In which case, what do you give up? The cash flows you'd have got from those lost sales. So I made your life easy in the case by taking that option off the table, right? Because I forced you to build new capacity. But you can already see that if I hadn't done that, your life would have gotten a lot more complicated because then you'd have had to decide whether Home Depot was better off cutting back on their regular store sales and using their existing capacity. But if you have to build new capacity earlier rather than later, what's, a, what's the effect of that on your net present value? After all, you're going to build new capacity in year 6 versus year 11. You're going to build it anyway, so why do I care that you... Because there's time value of money, right? If you spend a billion dollars in year 6, instead of spending a billion dollars in year 11, it's actually more expensive for you because in present value terms, spending a billion is more than spending. So already you can see that if you play this out, and you have to play this out. You can't just say, there's excess capacity today, therefore I'm going to do it. You have to play it out and think through the consequences of how it affects your present value. I've dropped more than a hint here. So maybe you want to watch this section of the, uh, of the lecture over and over again. It's not going to help you. Okay? But I dropped so many hints, I'm, a f I, I'm, I'm thinking through and say, I shouldn't have dropped this many hints. Okay? I made a mistake. I'll try to erase these last five minutes of the lecture. But this can be your advantage, your competitive advantage over the people who did not show up today. <laughs> Unless they happen to be in your group, in which case, so punish them till the last and then give them the answer. Right? So when we start on Wednesday, we will start with the case. So I'll bring in my analysis of the case. And if you can get me the numbers, that'll be great. It's a cash flow. You have a cash flow table. Why not just leave it in your mind? But like you have to calculate the Why do you need to calculate the initial investment? You're computing just the net present value of the property. But you must You don't need you don't need the, uh, the to bring it back to today to do the IRR. The IRR is just that that is contrary. Why do you need an initial investment to do IRR? You just need cash flows in an IRR. Why can't you leave the cash flows where they are? I don't see a need to do initial investment. There should be like the I don't think it's next week and but the week after that. Why? Why can't you have positive in the front, negative in the later? You have well, you need only one sign change. Yes. But the fact that you have a capital expenditure in year seven doesn't necessarily make the cash flow negative, right? Yes. Because so you can have so as long as you, your final cash flow is positive, it's still going to work. So if you get a negative cash flow in year seven or eight because of capital expenditure. Then you have to worry about sign changes more than once. But I don't think that's going to happen. So how would it be negative at the year, like the end of the year? What do you mean negative at the end of the year? Uh, like for example, say year nine. If you have a negative, do you have a negative final cash flow? No. Then why do you care? Like then all cash flow will be positive. So no, the initial investment is still going to be, you still are building an initial project, right? The, 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 you're buying the the North Carolina furniture store for two billion. That's still there. 
How would that be positive? Yeah. So, so you're, you're saying that capital expenditure shouldn't be counted as initial investment? I'm saying it doesn't matter. Ultimately, it all goes into an MPV. Why does it? You can call it initial investment if you want, but you don't have all have to bring it to your zero and call it initial investment. It's all part of a negative cash flow. It's in your NPV anyway. So why does it matter whether you leave it in your seven and then discount it or bring it to your zero up front and then add them up? It has no effect, right? Net present value is still net. Ultimately, what do you care about? The net present value of the product. You don't care about whether how much of it is initial investment. So if you want to bring it all to your zero, all your investments, you can. Okay? But the net present value is going to be exactly the same as if you left them in the years they are and discounted the net cash flow. So accounting return, uh, return on capital, um, do we calculate like in a per year basis? Like we have a return on capital every year. As opposed to what? Okay, instead yeah. of like do it in initial And then what? What are you going to use as your um, operating income? I thought like uh, that would be like your, your return and your initial capital. Yeah, but what are you going to divide the initial capital by to get to a return on capital? You need something in the numerator. So what are you going to use as earnings? But which year? Each year. <laughs> so basically, you've already answered your question. It's changing yeah, yeah. every year. How do you yeah, decide yeah. which one to use? Right? Thank you so yeah. much. Yes. Uh, this is a passive income. Okay. I understand this, this one is easy, and I understand this part. However, there's also like the depreciation. Yeah, bring it all in. Tax. Yeah, you've got to bring everything in. You've got to carry it to so the logical. So the PV should be the both the tax benefit and the, the timing yeah. difference yeah. of the, the yeah. investment. I owe you. Uh, just I have two questions. Mm -hmm. One was regarding the exam. That's on May 12th, right? So it's, it's an intra-exam. So that applied before May 11th. No, I'll, I'll give you, there'll be an early exam on May 10th. 